Amen. He died that we might live. Amen. But death could not hold him. And that's what this is about this morning. You know, as these individuals are coming to the waters of baptism, it's, you know, again, it's, it's that public expression of what Christ has done. And I love meeting, you know, every time I get to the Sunday of, of baptism weekend, like I'm amped up, like I'm always so amped up uh, to preach just because I've been spending time uh, with these individuals and hearing their testimonies and just hearing their story. And I love that. Like I love, I love the twist and turns. And, and I love how the Lord just, you know, from so many different places brings us uh, and unites us in, in Christ. And I love some of the statements, you know, little kids, it's very common. I've been doing this now at least here for 11 years. And I would dare to say there's not been a baptism uh, where I've met with someone where I didn't have at least one of the kids ask me, how long are you going to hold us under? Like, that's always a question that can't, comes up in the like, like that it, it doesn't count unless you're down for three seconds, right? And I tell them, no, we, we baptize, you know, my running joke is we do baptism by immersion, not submersion. Submersion means you stay under. Immersion means you come up, right? And the kids, that's not a good joke for the kids because the kids are kind of very frightened when they hear that. And so I explain to them that what we believe is that Jesus is risen, Amen. And so it wouldn't be the proper picture if we left you under the water. The proper picture is that we come out of the water. And that, again, symbolizes the great resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so it's always a, a great blessing of mine to sit and to meet and to talk through uh, baptism. And so it's really cool. The book of James, James chapter 1. If you would take your Bibles and go with me there. We're continuing in our series of promises. And my prayer through this entire series, this is now the third week we back up two weeks ago, we talked about the assurance, the promise of salvation. Last week, we talked about the assurance, the promise of answered prayer. Today, we talk about the assurance, the promise of victory, of living a life of victory. But let me say this up front. Like, it is with great humility that I stand before you even preaching on these subjects. Because I've struggled with every single one of these. And I would dare to say that if you've walked with Christ long enough... You too have struggled somewhere in these promises. The assurance of salvation, check. Struggle with that? I think we all have at some point in time in our walk with Christ. You know, the assurance of answered prayer, check. I've struggled with that. Lord, do you see me? Do you hear me? Do you really understand what's happening in my life, what's happening in these circumstances? We've all been there before. And even today, right, in the subject of victory, you know, this can be something that the enemy can use to discourage us very quickly. Because one of the things that we recognize as we walk with the Lord Jesus Christ each day, one of the things, I don't know if you've recognized it, I know I recognize it very quickly, that I personally, Heath Burris, am no match for the attacks of the enemy. I am no match for the pull of my sinful nature. I am no match for the pull of a world that is continuing to go against the things of God. I am no match for the wiles, as Paul says, the tricks, the schemes of the enemy. However, my Savior is. Can I get an amen? Amen. So what I want you to hear through this series is Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. The assurance of salvation, where is it found? It's in Jesus. The assurance of answered prayer, where is it found? It's in Jesus. The assurance of victory, where is it found? It's in Jesus. And so my prayer is as we finish this series, five weeks, that every time you hear one of these promises is that immediately your mind would make the connection to Christ. Because every one of these things goes back to a person, not a religion, not even a set of beliefs, a person, the Lord Jesus Christ, that provides assurance, that provides the security of confidence of knowing we can approach the throne of God that he hears us, that provides the assurance of victory. And so all of these things comes back to Christ, and it requires the hardest thing, I think, for all of us, which is surrender. There's the initial surrender right unto faith, and I pray that every person in here has done that, but maybe you never have, but there's the initial surrender of coming to a recognition that, again, I have a problem. That my greatest problem and their greatest problem is one and the same before God, that I am a sinner. And because of my sins, here's the problem. There's nothing I can do to fix it. There's no amount of religion. There's no amount of ordinances within the church or ceremonies within the church to fix my sin problem. And so it's coming to that place of recognizing there's one way. There's one person where Jesus says, John 14, 6, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So what does it require? Surrender. To fall on your face before God and say, Lord, I recognize that I'm a sinner, first and foremost. And there's nothing I can do to fix that problem. 
But by faith, right, Ephesians 2, 8, by faith, I put my faith in the one who has done it for me, Jesus Christ, who lived the life that I couldn't live, a life that met your standards of holiness and righteousness and sinlessness, and therefore died the death that I couldn't die, a death that was a substitutionary death, fulfilling the wrath and judgment of a holy God. But then he rose again. And so I pray that as we walk through this, that you see This isn't about us. This is about Christ in us. And one of the things I believe the enemy uses is he wants us to look into ourselves. The assurance of salvation, well, let's look at your actions. And let's be real, we know how he can use that against us. The assurance of answered prayer was you, well, let's look at your circumstances. And we know how he can cast doubt upon that. Okay, the assurance of victory, well, let's look at how, uh, how, how strong you are. And so immediately when we begin to put ourselves into the equation, we recognize that we are no match to these things. So it has to be Christ. Take your Bibles, if you would, and stand with me in reverence to reading God's Word. So how the message this morning, victory in Jesus. Are you singing the hymn in your head? I've been singing it all week. Victory in Jesus. What's the next line? There it is. My Savior forever. I'm going to break out the Baptist hymnals if y'all ain't careful. Here we go. Let's read this. We're going to read two sections here, all right? So James 1. And I want you to see the difference here. There's a word that's used in verse 2. In my translation, it's trial. Some translation, you'll find the word temptation used in verse 2 and also used in verse 12. But it actually is two different words here. And it's two different things that James is explaining. In verse 2, he's talking about the trials, the testings that God uses in our lives specifically to grow us, to mature us, to deepen us, uh, to, to, to make us more like Christ, right? As you go to verse 12, and we're going to look at this in a minute, he's speaking of temptation that the enemy uses. Again, all under the authority of God, but specifically initiated by the enemy, not for the purpose of growth or maturity, but obviously for the purpose of hindering the work of God in our lives. So let's read these two sections. Let's begin with verse 1. We'll read down to verse 8, and then we'll jump over to verse 12. It says this. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, my brethren, count it all joy. When you fall into various trials. Let's read that again. Count it all joy. Are you in a trial this morning? Count it joyful when you find yourself in various trials. And I love the next two words of verse 3. Knowing that, that's important. When you know that there's a purpose behind it. When you know that there's a reason behind it. When you know that God is over it. Knowing that you're joyful, not because of your circumstances. You're joyful knowing that God is using your circumstances. For what purpose? Look at what he says. Verse 3, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Patience has its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete. It means mature, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally without a reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. Look at what he says in verse 12. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. But James says, let's set the record straight with verse 13. Let no one say when he is tempted that they are tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. Verse 14 is really the verse that we're going to break down this morning. It says this, but each one is tempted when he is drawn away. It's where we get the word lured. It's fisherman's terms, basically. When he is lured away, well, lured away by what? By his own desires, that's the inside, that's the sinful nature, now matching up with the wiles, the tricks, the schemes of the enemy. So the inside, now matching up to the outside, this is where the word enticing comes from. Look at what he says. But when he is tempted, he is lured away, drawn away by his own desires inside, sinful nature, that then is matched up to what? And then enticed, it's on the outside. And when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, brings forth death. And then we'll finish with verse 16. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Join with me as we go to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Lord, we come before you this morning, Lord, again, recognizing our utter dependence upon you. Lord, obviously, unto salvation, we understand that there's nothing we can do to earn that, to work for that, that it is not found in the merit of man, it's in the mercy of God, and we thank you for that. That by your grace, You have chose to save us. And we thank you for a savior. We thank you for Jesus, a high priest, as your word tells us, who passed through the heavens, who identifies with us, who understands us. 
was without sin, but was tempted in all ways as we are. Knowing, Lord, that we have a high priest to run to, that we have an advocate to go before, can empathize with what we're doing and understand. So, Lord, we thank you for not only that, but we thank you for a Savior who is victorious, who have a Savior who conquered the Father's will, who died, who was buried, but who rose again. And Lord, you have promised to those who have been buried in Christ and who have been raised to walk in newness of life, Lord, you have promised freedom and you have promised victory that's found in Jesus, not in ourselves. And so, Lord, help us each day to lay our stuff down, to be emptied of us so that we can be filled with you. Lead us and guide us through this passage, Lord. We thank you for the living hope of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we pray it in his name and all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. And so right up front, again, kind of understanding the difference between the two, verse 2, he's talking about the testing of the trials that God sends our way. Verse 12, he's talking about the temptations that the enemy sends our way. Again, understanding that God uses these trials to grow us, to mature us, to deepen us. And by the way, that never stops. That if you know Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are on a lifelong journey of sanctification. That yes, he loves us just the way that we are, but he loves us way too much to let us stay that way. That by his grace and his mercy, hey, we come as we are to the Lord. But as we surrender that then initially, then there's what? There's that process of sanctification. There's that lifelong journey. And it's not a marathon, or it's not a sprint, it's a marathon of how God takes the truth of his word. He takes the power of his Holy Spirit that lives inside of us and he gets into the cracks and corners of our lives. And by the truth of his word, what happens? He shines the light into areas. And it's in that point that what? We come to a place and many times at a crossroads of do I hold on to this? Do I keep this? Do I not turn from this? Or do I surrender this and trust this before the Lord? And listen, easier said than done. Because we all have our little thing. If we're not careful, we can all have our little thing. Where we say, Lord, I give you most of me. I give you 95% of me. That's enough, right? I'll go to church and I'll do my best to lead my family. But this one area over here, I'm going to hold on to that for a little while. And we know that a cracked door, right, is what the enemy uses many times to throw the door open. And so James says, understand how all of this plays out. But what I love here is he kind of gives us some foundational truths. Look at verse 13. I think this is very important. He says this, let no one say, notice this word when. He doesn't say let, let no one say if they are tempted. He says let no one say when. He says, listen, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. That every single day, something we have to understand as a child of God who is seeking to walk with Jesus every day, I have to recognize and be aware of the fact that there is a battle, a spiritual battle that is raging every single day. And so he says, listen, it's not a matter of if, it's when. That just as I could stand on this stage for hours, days, weeks, months and preach God is love, and God is grace, and God is merciful, and God has provided his son, and God has a plan and a purpose for your life. All of those statements are true, but at the same amount of time, I could stand up here and tell you, we have an enemy who hates us, who wants nothing more than to destroy us, to destroy our families, our marriages, our children, our church. And so we have to be alert, but understand the victory does not rest in our hands. The victory has already been won by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The starting point is critical here because when you put it on yourself, let me tell you what's going to happen. And I've been there. You will be crippled because if it's on you, then listen, you are no match. I am no match to these things. And so what does it require? First of all, it requires knowing the Lord. Number two, it requires being emptied before the Lord. Understanding that, Lord, again, if if I am to walk in victory, it requires me to be flat on my face. What does Jesus say? That if you want to live, you must be willing to die. You've got to lay it down. And so the place of power for a believer is on their face before God saying, God, Galatians 2.20, you know, I am crucified with Christ. It's no longer my day. It's no longer my life. It's no longer my resources. Lord, everything I am, I give to you. I am crucified with Christ, but now I've been raised to walk in newness of life. It is now Christ that lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live in faith in the Son of God, and we're the only ones who can say this, who loved me and gave himself for me. And so I love this. Right up front, he establishes some foundational truths. 
And it really points us back to Ephesians 6. Very quickly, let me just read this passage where Paul really gives us the greatest summary of spiritual warfare. He says this in Ephesians 6.10. He says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord, the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against what? The wiles of the devil, the tricks, the schemes of the devil. Look at what he says. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. The wiles of the devil, the tricks, the schemes of the devil. If I asked you right now, picture the devil in your mind. Right now, picture the devil in your mind. Do it right now. Let me tell you how masterful he is. How many of you pictured horns and a pitchfork? You know what I'm talking about, right? We have this image even of what the devil looks like, and yet the Bible tells us that what? If he walked in here, he'd be a bright shining star, that he again would be, he would be so deceptive that we wouldn't even be able to recognize him. The battle that rages in us every single day. And when we fall or when we stumble or when we trip, we all have this tendency, and I believe this goes back to our sinful nature, to want to pass the blame. Well, that wasn't really my fault. I know I gave in to that temptation, but really, you know, it was, it was because of the situation. Right? We're a master in this. When I was young, I mastered this as a little kid. Listen, Mom and Dad, it's not my fault that I was out hanging out with the neighborhood kids tipping over trash cans. It's not that I ever did that. It's y'all's fault for moving me to this neighborhood. I didn't ask to move to Virginia. I was happy in South Carolina rooting for Clemson Tigers being country and not knowing it. Y'all the one who moved us to Virginia. It's not my fault I took a pack of M&Ms from the, door, the, the exit of the grocery store. Who put it by the exit door? It's their fault. It was confusing to a little kid. I thought it was something that it's like, take a penny, leave a penny. I didn't know that you couldn't take it. Yeah, my dad didn't buy that one. I had to write a letter. To that, that one I actually did. The tipping of the trash cans, I'll plead the fifth. But the actual stealing of the, the candy, I had to write a letter to the manager of the grocery store and then pay back tenfold. I was three. I'm just kidding. I was a little bit older than that. I was a little bit older. I can't write a three. I'm just kidding. I was a sinner at three, but I had not stolen m and yet. But we can even play this out with God, right? I mean, let's be real. You know, we, we fall into this place and we can even say, you know, I do this because of the environment that God put me in. Or I'm like this way, or I struggle with this, or I have this pet sin because of the family he put me in. I didn't choose them. I lost the lottery when I was born in this family. Not me personally. I'm just saying what we can think sometimes, right? I didn't pick this family. I didn't pick the struggles of my mom and dad. If God is sovereign, that's his fault. And we don't mean to, right? But I think our sinful nature, rather than taking responsibility for ourselves, I do this because of the hurt and the pain that God has allowed me to experience. If he is sovereign, and if he has authority, then he's allowed this in my life. Well, this is the reason why. So ultimately, it's God's fault. And let's be real, we're not the first ones to do this. Do you, you do realize who did this first. It was the first person ever created who played this card. Do you remember the story of Adam? God is looking for them. Sin has entered into humanity. Genesis 3:12. And he says, where are you, Adam? And Adam says, we are hiding. God says, why are you hiding? He says, because we are naked. God says, how do you know that you are naked? Do you remember Adam's response in Genesis 3:12? Because of the woman you gave me, is what he's saying. <laughs> Ain't cause of me, God. It's the woman's fault. And by the way, let me double down on that. Not only is it the woman's fault, it's actually your fault because you're the one who gave me the woman. I was content playing video games and just hanging out with the animals. I didn't even know that I needed a helper. You're the one who brought me this helper, and she's the reason that we find ourselves in this situation. I was telling my dad, every, you know, usually Fridays we get together, and my dad will say, what are you preaching on? And, and I'll say, what are you preaching on? And we'll kind of go back and forth. And so I was telling him about this little illustration here about uh, you know, Adam and kind of, you know, how we like to shift the blame. He said, Heath, that reminds me of a story. And he said it. He said, Heath, that reminds me of a story. <laughs> and there was no one around to, it was just him and I. And I was just like, oh man, you just said it. I've not heard you say it. But he said it. And then he said this. He said, I got a joke for your people. And I said, well, dad, my people aren't used to low level jokes. My people are used. So Adam and Eve, right, they were together, and they were in the garden, they were having a great time, and, and Adam was getting up early in the morning and, and going out at night and just walking through the garden. Well, Eve got a little suspicious, and Eve came to Adam and said, Adam, is there another woman in your life? 
Adam says, Eve, don't be ridiculous. First of all, we're the only two people on this earth, literally, okay? And you know the story. God formed you out of me. I mean, he took a rib from my side, and he formed you and gave me a helpmate. They went to bed. He thought everything was done. They're middle of the night. He felt someone just punching him, just punching him. He woke up to Eve punching him in the gut, and he said, Eve, what are you doing? She said, I'm counting your ribs. <laughs> Get it? Another rib, another girl. Dad said, well, then, Heath, you can tell him this joke. And I said, Dad, we don't tell jokes at River Oak Church, okay? For, for 35 minutes, it is a deep study of theological principles. Maybe at Kempsville, you tell jokes. We don't do that around here. He said, well, tell him this one. So I got to go one more. I got to double down. This is actually really good. And I wish I could take credit for it, but it was my dad's. And so there was a young couple. They were getting ready to get married. And so the husband was really nervous. He goes to his dad. He says, Dad, you know my dilemma? I've got really stinky feet, and I don't want her to know about my stinky feet. He said, no worries. Put your socks on at 8 o'clock. Keep them on. Go to bed with them on. Do not take them off in her presence. He said, I can do that. Well, the wife, future wife, was really nervous as well. She goes to her mom, and she says, Mom, she said, you know my morning breath. I got really bad morning breath, and I really don't want him to know that. She said, no worries. You need to brush at 8, brush again at 9, brush at 10, and then when you get up in the morning, get to the bathroom first and brush your teeth. Three weeks goes by. Everything's going great. In the middle of the night, about the third week, the man wakes up and realizes that his feet, that his socks are off of his feet. And so he goes into his cover. He's kind of panicking. He's trying to find his socks, and he comes face to face with his wife. She says, honey, what are you doing? He says, oh, my goodness. <laughs> I haven't even told the punchline yet. <laughs> he says, oh, my goodness, I think you ate my socks. All right, here we go. <laughs> oh, right, yeah. So, so Kelly Burris is going to get the best laugh out of 11 years here. But we can do that, right? And so James says, all right, let's set the record straight. Let's know where this comes from, right? So look at what he says here. Verse 12, he begins with the promise. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, here he is putting our eyes on eternity, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised for those who love him. Take your Bibles and flip one page. For many of you, one page. First Peter, one page. First Peter 1, you want to talk about lifting our eyes, you want to talk about the, the blessings that come, he says, listen, be encouraged in the face of opposition. Be encouraged as you endure temptation, because again, there are great eternal rewards there. First Peter 1, 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Jesus is the connection to all of these promises, to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that does not fade away, reserved for you in heaven. James says, be encouraged. That even when you feel the weight of that opposition, be encouraged. Be encouraged in the simple fact that God is working in your life. That if the enemy is attacking you this much, then man, there's some great things that God is desiring to do in your life, in your marriage, in your home. You see, we can flip this on the enemy in a way. That rather than being so consumed by, man, I'm just so tired, I'm just so weary because I just keep getting beat up, to know, flip it and go, you know what? If the enemy is attacking us this way, if he's attacking our marriage and attacking our family, you know what? God is doing great things. And so let's stand strong. Let's continue to persevere. Let's continue to have joy. And James says this to understand how this process works. And he says in verse 13, let's set the record straight. Let no one say, just as Adam did, that I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. So if it doesn't come from God, where does it come from? Great question. Glad you asked. Look at what he says in verse 14. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away. Again, he's using fishermen's terms here. When they are lured away. Think about how you lure a fish with the colors and the movement of that lure. That lure many times is specific to the fish that you're trying to catch. Think about that, how the enemy works in our lives. But each one is tempted when he is lured away by his own desires and enticed. Now, that's important, that little phrase there, his own desires. Because what James is establishing is this, that the foundation of every single one of our, our spiritual warfare comes back to our sinful nature. That it comes from within. Lured away, but by your own desires. He says what? That's what you're born with. That's your sinful nature. That's your flesh. That even again, a born-again child of God, redeemed by the power and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, indwelled by his Holy Spirit, we still battle our flesh. Every one of us. 
That's why Paul speaks so much about walking either in the spirit or walking in the flesh. The question that you all ask is, what are you feeding? Are you feeding the flesh? Are you feeding the spirit? What wins out in our lives? Well, what are you feeding? Are you feeding the work of God? Are you feeding the work of the flesh? James says, understand it begins on the inside. And it begins with our sinful nature. He says, we are tempted when we are drawn away by our own desires. Another translation says this, we are tempted when we are drawn away by our own lusts. Now, that word is interesting. The root of the word lust is where we get the word heat. And so basically it's this, lust is something that burns on the inside of our being. So follow with me what James is saying here. It basically means this, desire in the wrong way. It basically means cravings and longings outside of the guidelines of the word of God and the will of God. Because I think we can all come to this agreement, right? God has given us all certain desires that are normal and natural. But when those things are exercised outside of his guidelines and outside of his will, the Bible says this is where the enemy steps in. Understanding he has no original material. Understanding he can only take the things that God has given us and pervert them and distort them. Think about it. There's nothing wrong with eating, but gluttony is a sin. There's nothing wrong with sleeping, but laziness is a sin. There's nothing wrong with sex. God created it. He initiated it inside of a husband and wife relationship, but sexual immorality is a sin. No original material. And so he takes the things that God has implanted into us and he distorts them. Look at the next part of verse 14. Notice how this matches up now. Each one is tempted when he's drawn away, when he's lured by his own desires. It begins with our sinful nature. That's the inside. But then it's matched up when we are enticed. The word enticed literally means something on the outside. So you can kind of see the scheme, right? We're doing a scouting report right here on the enemy to understand their tactics, right? To understand, you know, the things that they, their go-to moves. This is what James says. James says, we are lured away by our own sinful nature, but then the enemy matches that up with stuff on the outside. He entices us through temptation. I mean, there's no wonder why Peter describes the enemy as a roaring lion. You know, I think about you know, just the animal, right? I mean, I've always just been, you know, just enamored with big cats, like from Africa and Asia and all that. I've loved watching those shows, but I want to watch them from a distance. Like, I don't need to hang out with them, you know what I'm saying? Like, we were going to Lesotho a couple years ago and driving there, Jim Floor, our missionary, pulled over and I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, well, there's a lion. These people own a lion. It's like this, just this little wired fence. And he's like, come on, get out of the truck and come look at the lion. I said, I can see through this window just fine. I can see the lion, and I'm faster than you, just know that. So if he comes after us, I'm out of here. But anyway, so we've seen these pictures. I, somebody sent me this video a while back. Maybe you've seen it. You've seen the videos of like these animals that, that come to these kids at like the zoo through glass. You know what I'm talking about? I, I, this past week, my mind went to it, and it kind of stuck right here with the passage of First Peter. Go to the video if you would. 1 Peter 5.8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. All right, let's go to the video. Pause. Now, how cute does that lion look right there? You know what I'm saying? Like, I just want to snuggle with that thing right there. Like, he just looks, he, he looks like Alex from Madagascar. Like, that's not a mean, that's not a mean lion. That's a theater kitty. Like, you just want to go and hang out with that thing, right? And so I look at this, okay, temptation, lust, from a distance. Oh, that ain't that bad. From a distance, I can play with that. From a distance, you know, I can, I can kind of work as long as I kind of keep my distance, right? But if our enemy is described as a roaring lion who seeks to kill, steal, and destroy our lives, our testimonies, our families, watch this. Oh, we're just living. Let me turn around. Let me go to church. Wop. All right, pause. <laughs> like, I've seen that video a lot, and every time my heart drops, every time that thing comes at the glass. It gives me a different perspective. Like we just, we start our day, we go outside, we're living our lives, and that's behind us? We don't give a second thought to how he's described in Scripture. We don't give a second thought to the schemes, to the enticement that he uses, and yet we wonder, right? We wonder, how did I get here? How did this happen? Peter says, understand he is a roaring lion. He's patient. 
He lies in wait, and at just the right moment, he pounces. It happens on the inside. Therefore, it has to be dealt with on the inside. There's no power when you talk about determination or discipline. No, the power is found in the blood of Jesus Christ. The power has to be on the inside. If the battle begins on the inside, you got to deal with it on the inside. And then in understanding that, it's walking each day, not being fearful, not being afraid, because we know the victory that has been won. And we know our Savior is described as the Lion of the tribe of Judah, Revelations 5.5. Can I get an amen? Amen? So we understand the finished, the finished work of Christ. But we're no match for this, man. I'm no match for this. We just kind of go out and we turn around and we're just kind of doing life. And we're not on guard to the attacks of the enemy. Look at what he says here in verse 15. Then when desire or lust has conceived, he's now talked about the process, right? He talks about being drawn away, being lured. He talks about our sinful nature, how it triggers. And then he talks about the enticement on the outside, now matching on the inside. He says this is the result of all of that, verse 15. Then when desire or lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, brings forth How did I get here? The answer to that question is one step at a time. So many times we'll look back and be like, man, I can't believe I've drifted so far from the Lord. And you go back and you look and you see that it was just one subtle compromise at a time. And then all of a sudden you look up and you think to yourself, how did I get here? And one of the great lies of the enemy is that we have to travel that whole distance to come back to Jesus. But let me tell you something. On the authority of the word of God, you are one step away. You are one step away from returning to the Lord. Maybe initially, maybe you've never initially surrendered your life to the Lord and said, you know what? I've lived crippled and in bondage to these things. I've tried it my way. I want to surrender to him. But maybe you've surrendered to him and you know him, but you are struggling. And every day he is having his way in your life. And you're recognizing that you're fighting Fighting these battles in your own strength. And there were no match to the schemes, to the lies, to the tricks of the devil. I love this passage, Romans 6. Let me read this. Do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? That is the picture of death as they are being laid back into the waters. Therefore, we were buried with him. That's the picture of the water covering the face through baptism into death. But here it is, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also, even so we also should walk in newness of life. To know that the chains have been broken, that my victory is not founded in me. My victory is found it in Christ. And I love the statement that says what? I found my life when I laid it down. And that's the picture of Galatians 2.20, that the place of power is on my face before God, surrendered before God, recognizing that there is a line that is pursuing my marriage, my family, our church. And so, Lord, you are not going to be my last resort. You will be my first resource. And before I even step out of the door today, I claim the victory that is won by Jesus. And I walk in the victory that keeps me, that secures me, that seals me, and I lift my eyes off of just the trials of the now, and I realize that I am blessed. I am blessed because of the promises that are still to come. It's a different perspective. Let me tell you something. The last thing he wants us to know, the enemy that is, that the chains of sin have been broken through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What does it require? The emptying of self. And I believe it's the hardest thing. I know it's the hardest thing for me to say, Lord, I give you all areas. Not just most. Not just the places that people can see. I lay it all before you. Because I know if there's one place that I hold back, That will be the go-to place of the enemy every single time. And so I rest in you with every head bowed and every eye closed. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 is a great promise. It says this, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. Listen to this, but God is faithful. But our God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. If God is for us, then who can be against us? Greater is he who lives in me than he who lives in this world. 
And so, Lord, I'm laying myself down as I come before you, even as I start this day. I'm seeking truth because I need truth in my life to lead me, to guide me, but also to grow me. Lord, I lay this trial, I lay these circumstances before you, and there's joy here because I know it's not random and it's not without a purpose. I don't know what that is, but, Lord, I trust that you do. Lord, you know I am weak. But when I am weak, you are strong. And so, Lord, I lay myself down. I know where it's gotten me in my own strength. I need the strength of Jesus that lives inside of me. So allow me to get out of the way and to stay out of the way that your power, your presence may shine through in my life. Listen, if you're here today and you've never called upon the name of Jesus, all of these promises, I'll say it at the beginning and I'll say it as we end. They all hinge upon a person. It's Jesus and it's a relationship. That's why I always say what I preach is not a religion. What I preach is a relationship with the Son of God who came, lived, and died and rose again and desires to have a relationship with you. To believers in this place, does he have all of you? Does he have all of you? Whatever area it is that you've not handed over, I guarantee you will be the place that that roaring lion will seek to devour. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you. Lord, we rest in the finished work of Jesus, the finished work of Jesus, that, Lord, there is victory in the fact that our Savior is risen. There is victory over death, over our sins, over the grave. And Lord, you've called us now to live a resurrected life. But Lord, we recognize that that begins as we start our day with a crucified death, that we nail our agenda, even our desires, our dreams, all of those things, Lord, that we would nail them to the cross, die to those old things, and walk in newness of life. Live a resurrected life. So, Lord, search our hearts. If there's one here who's never called upon your name, Lord, may you draw them close to you. May you give them courage to cry out the name of Jesus. To believers, may you encourage them, regardless of if they've stumbled on their way in today, hobbling along, Lord, we rest in the victory of Jesus. We pray it is his name and all God's people said, amen. I invite you to stand as we begin to sing.